Hi, can everyone hear me? <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Michelle. Hi, good afternoon and welcome. I'm Joanna Drowis. I'm the Associate Dean for Faculty Affairs, and I'm one of the physicians who practices at the Marcus Institute for Integrative Health. I have the dis oh, I'm echoing. I have the distinct pleasure of um, introducing our speaker today. But before we get started, just a reminder: if everybody could please mute your cell phones, uh, turn them to silent, and um, and enjoy your lunch. So our speaker today is uh, our Dean, Dr. Julie Politsis. She's Dean of the Schmidt College of Medicine and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Florida Atlantic University. Dr. Politsis is a neurosurgeon with a passion for treating chronic neurological disorders that interrupt a person's day-to-day -day function or abilities. Illnesses that fall under this term can include chronic pain, Parkinson's disease, essential tremor, obsessive compulsive disorders, and trigeminal neuralgia. Board certified in neurological surgery, Dr. Politsis is affiliated with the Boca Raton Regional Hospital and Marcus Neuroscience Institute. She received her MD with distinction from Albany Medical College, a PhD in physiology from Wayne State University, and an MBA with a concentration in health informatics from Fayetteville State University. Dr. Politsis completed residency training in neurosurgery at Wayne State University and a fellowship in functional neurosurgery from Rush University Medical Center. Thank you and welcome. And um, Sarah's gonna monitor the chat. So anybody who's joining us on Zoom, feel free to uh, put your questions in there. Everyone else, we can save them till the end. Thanks everybody, great to see you. Um, let me just get this going. Okay, uh, I'm gonna, I can't see the little mouse. You could just put it on slideshow, that'd be awesome. Which buttons you hit? Ah. F5. Uh, fun fact. Uh, so today, uh, you know, I do a lot of different things in my practice. It was pretty much a rude awakening when I came here to become dean, because prior to that, for the last 15 years, um, I took care of patients almost on a daily basis. So I was operating three days a week and seeing clinic a, a day a week. And then there were years, actually, where I did about 400 cases a year. And a lot of those were treated patients with chronic pain. So I have a lot of expertise in uh, taking care of these folks. And um, I don't think that any um, integrative health is better. Uh, like, I think it's great for a lot of different things, but chronic pain in particular, there's a real a niche there. Donna, this is... Hello. Oh, I see you in a bit. <laughs> so what I wanted to talk about is what is chronic pain? Uh, what does neurosurgery have to offer and how can surgery and integrative approaches be combined? Um, and I apologize to some of you that uh, heard my talk at uh, Baptist Boca, because there's some redundancy the, in the beginning. Um, the second half will be all new. So when we talk about pain, um, you know, this is the data. And so actually in hot pink, you see the number of people in this, you know, don't pay attention to which region of the country they're in. It's just meant to show how many people have which disease. So in hot pink, you see all the number of people that suffer with chronic pain. And then if you look at the other colors, that's cancer, heart disease, and diabetes combined. So you can see that this is really... Um, endemic to our culture and our lives and the people we interact with on a daily basis. And this is a real problem. And yet with everything that you have to learn in medical school, um, we don't spend a lot of time talking about this. Uh, oftentimes because it, um, it doesn't fall 
into one bucket. So you'll get tidbits here and there. Um, but I think no matter whether you're in my specialty or you're in um, Dr. Collins, who is our new integrative health expert specialty, uh, Dr. Drowis, who does primary care, uh, you, you see this um, regardless of where you are. So whenever we talk about chronic pain, we talk about the opioid uh, uh, epidemic. And a lot of this it has happened for a variety of reasons, but just historically, so you know, um, there was um, a big movement at one point, probably about 20 years ago, for people to ask, you know, how, when you come to the doctor's office, uh, how much pain are you in? You know, you, who's gotten asked that question? Zero to 10, what's your pain level? And um, regardless of what you're there for. And so when you ask that question, you know, like, well, what do we as doctors do? Well, we want to we fix that. Um, if it's abnormal. So, you know, you'll take, go to the doctor and you'll take your blood pressure. And so if your blood pressure is, you know, 150 over a hundred, you know, generally what we'll say is have somebody retake it and then try to treat that number. So when people were having a pain score above five, you know, it was automatic that people would want to treat that. And that became a problem because the NRS, and we'll talk a little bit about it, the numeric rating scale score, uh, visual analog scale score, all kind of the same thing, a 10 point scale or hundred point scale, however you want to look at it. Um, different people have different baseline levels of that. So it's not something like blood pressure per se that you can treat and have normal values for. And we don't have a good way of understanding what people's normal are. So doctors were prescribing lots of medications and you know then we could get into controversial topics about big pharma and other things, but ultimately a lot of opioids were prescribed. Another thing that happens, and this still happens in training, and so this is like, like a, a pearl to think about when you're in the wards um, is, you know, when oh, and it's happened to me, like I, I still have to like consciously change it. Um, so, you know, somebody comes in for some surgery, it's an outpatient surgery, I send them home, what do I send them home with? 40 of whatever, pick my poison is, of the day of that medication, regardless if it's something where they shouldn't even really need the med or they're going to need a lot of the med. So just be thoughtful about what you send people home with because a lot of the epidemic started with prescription meds that were over prescribed for people or people getting a hold of these things. So when we think about pain, you know, there's a, a lot of aspects of this. So why does pain exist? Well, it's a protective mechanism. So you want, you think about touching a hot stove. What do you do? You touch it burn yourself, pull your hand away. And, you know, then you say, ow, or whatever your expletive is. And, you know, so often then, you know, you, you rub it and create a different sensation, but, you know, you have that. And then you say, okay, I'm not going to touch a hot stove again. It, but with people with chronic pain, there isn't that cause and effect relationship. So it's not like they're, you know, touching a stove and having pain, they're sitting on their couch and those jolts of pain happen. So imagine that if you were just sitting there and things just came on, or you were walking from place to place and things just came on, like that'd be awful, right? And you know that would prevent you from doing your normal activities. That would make you socially isolated because you wouldn't want to leave the house because you couldn't predict when this was going to happen. Imagine that day after day after day, you'd get depressed, you'd get anxious. And so there are all those factors that go into chronic pain. Um, this is probably, you know, as M2s, uh, you know, probably something that, you know, you will wish you had saw when you were like a, in your PGY2 year, um, you know, because often you have people that are getting out of the hospital and you have to think about different things. The bottom line is, you know, when people are in pain, like opioids are, are only a small aspect of what we should use to treat them, especially with chronic pain. Like we really, opioids should only be used in a really small subset of people. So there's a variety of medications and no matter what specialty you go into, 
you should know what these medications are and how to dose them. And you don't need all of them. Like I, in neurosurgery, we use about 10 drugs. Um, you know, it's better than ortho where they use like Ansef as their only drug. Um, and, you know, but you should like, you should know a couple of drugs and keep that in mind. So, you know, Dr. Drowis introduced me uh, as a functional neurosurgeon. And um, really what happened during my training was um, in neurosurgery, we see a lot of awful things happen to people. We see people that have strokes. We have seen people that are dying of brain tumors. And um, when I realized that there was something in neurosurgery that could give people a better quality of life, that attracted me to the field. The fact that there's a lot of science involved in that and you know, I could never make up my mind between research and medicine helped a lot. And so that's how I fall into this specialty. And when we're talking about functional neurosurgery for chronic pain, there's a lot of different things you can do. Um, and, you know, uh, but I would say probably like 90% of it is spinal cord stimulation. And so these are devices that are implanted. Basically, it's a um, yeah, similar technology to pacemaker technology that uh, whose goal is to relieve people's pain by 50%. So it's not to get rid of all their pain. Pain is complicated, as we saw on that other slide, and there's a lot of emotions and other things that go into this, but to relieve 50% of the sensory phenomenon that they're dealing with. This is tried and true for people with back and leg pain, especially people that have previously had surgery. Um, and it's uh, also tried and true in complex regional pain syndrome, um, which is another thing that no matter what specialty you go into that you should know something about. So complex regional pain syndrome is a, um, it's an abnormal response to an injury. Uh, so, you know, it, it happens actually in 13% of people that break their wrists. They have chronic pain and some issues afterwards that are untoward. You see a lot of weird stuff. Like I've seen people with blood draws that then go on to have intractable pain in their arm. And the good thing to know about these patients is that this is potentially curable if you identify it. The problem is that, um, that people don't identify it. And there's like a whole thing. It's, it's really kind of a neat disease that's sympathetically mediated. So you have color changes and temperature changes and a whole bunch of things. And so that's another thing to have on your radar as you're seeing patients, because you can see that no matter what specialty you go into. So we can put these in a couple of ways. You know, it's a drug-free alternative. There's some less invasive ways where I do this percutaneously on um, this side of the screen and then open surgery for these bigger devices. And this allows us to modulate how the body feels pain. So we're asking a lot of these devices. And this is what I say to my patients that come in to see me. So you have like a 60 year old person, that's the mean age of the patient that got spinal cord stimulation in like the last 10 years of my practice. And most of they've had uh, chronic pain for about 12 years. Um, and this can vary. And, you know, they've tried a lot of things that have or haven't worked. And I, you know, I always say, you know, the goal here is to get you 50% pain relief. And it would be arrogant for me to think that you have suffered with all of this and you're going to come into my office and I'm going to make you better tomorrow. There's all of those other things that come into play with, you know, you're freaked out. Like you have this pain no matter what you're doing in life. So this is but part of the treatment. And, you know, from my perspective, this is a MRI of the lumbar spine, um, tailbones down there, heads way up there. Here's your back. Here's your belly. Um, when we think about, um, you know, the imaging and MRIs, as uh, Dr. Retrovi will teach you as you're going through this. T2-weighted images have white spinal fluid. So this is a T2-weighted image. And this is a, a pretty normal lumbar spine. Um, and, you know, it's radiologist's job to pick out all the abnormalities. So she's probably sitting here going, well, there's an L4, L5-S1 disc or, you know, some other things. But from a, a, a will surgery help this person? This is a pretty normal MRI. <laughs> And then we have some pretty abnormal MRI. Yeah. These are T2 weighted images or T1 weighted images. Um, and you know, it's harder to see, but here is an indication of somebody that's had spine surgery at every level up and down. 
And then here, uh, you know, when we think about scoliosis, sometimes you think about, you know, when you, I don't know, they still check you for scoliosis in school? Or is that like so outdated? <laughs> I know. Okay. So me and Dr. Michelle had this happen to us, but you know, it, it used to be something that you'd worry about in young people, but this is something that happens as we age as well. And so here are some abnormal pictures. So, you know, what this device can do is probably a lot dependent on what you're asking for or to do. You know, it would be like having, you know, a, a regular Phillips head screwdriver. What can that do for you? Yeah, I can probably do something in, you know, a standard home improvement, but, you know, it's probably not the right tool to do something more robust. So you just have to temper people's expectations as to what you can do based on their pathology. And how does this work? So, okay, when you bang your elbow on the desk, the first thing you do is, again, expletive, and then you take and rub your elbow and create this rubbing sensation. So you, have you learned about the gate theory of pain? So, um, you know, the gate theory of pain says, you know, that we change the way things are, are modulated. And spinal cord stim was based on that whole gate theory. And so basically what we were saying was, let's create an alternate sensation using those big fibers for the way pain is delivered using those small fibers. So what has happened since this time, and this is how like for decades, spinal cord stim first got invented in the 1960s, people thought it worked. And now, like, there's a whole different um, set of tools in mind uh, where there's been a lot of engineering advances. And now you can get pain relief without that rubbing sensation. So there's been a lot of thought by people that are scientists in the area going, hey, is the gate theory really explain everything? And, and it doesn't. You know, that's um, what we have the best handle on. But now there's other ways to modulate pain in the spine other than the gate theory of pain. So what we were able to do was spinal cord stim has uh, uh, typically been provided by um, anesthesiologists and just by the nature of the beast, a lot of pain anesthesiologists were in private practice. And so, you know, they would, it, it, and there's a lot of reasons for this, you know, you're doing like high volume and, you know, you need the uh, things that sometimes academic medicine has more of a challenge with. But this, uh, by doing this in an academic setting, what we were able to do was create the largest repository of outcomes for spinal cord stim in the world um, from the practice that I was in before. And this became something that um, a lot of my students got involved in. So this was actually uh, my first PhD student um, who is now a uh, Critical Care Fellow at uh, Jefferson. And so she received the paper of the year for this work showing that spinal cord stim can reduce opioids and not a shock. And, you know, this applies to any of your patients that undergo surgery. They're going to do better if they're not on opioids to begin with. So like, don't give out opioids unless you're being thoughtful about it. And that's not like for acute pain. This is all about chronic pain. So we're talking about two different things here. And chronic pain is defined as pain greater than three months. So this was a, um, we, we won neurosurgery's uh, pain paper of the year, three years running. It was very sad. I just came back from my national meeting. We didn't win this year. So we have to, there's my lab there. We have to repeat next year. Um, but this was another, uh, another group of um, work we did in terms of looking at uh, neuromodulation in a different group of um, uh, patients. And for this, um, it, if the chronic pain patient in general is complicated, I will tell you that the most complicated group is the chronic pelvic pain patient, because there is so much that has gone on to creating um, the situations that revolve around chronic pelvic pain. And so we actually... Um, one of my roles and responsibilities previously was to run our chronic pelvic pain health consortium in Albany. And um, so we established uh, a database showing that multidisciplinary approach where we use this and a bunch of other things worked well. And I wanted to point this out because uh, this uh, woman who was the first author here was actually my secretary at the time, and she wanted to go on to get her MPH. So these are really attainable goals um, for all of you doing research in terms of getting involved and getting some um, fame and glory around the research that you do.
This speaks a little bit to, you know, how to how are we changing what we're thinking about in terms of the gate theory? Well, we're delivering that stimulus differently. And so, you know, when you deliver an electrical stimulus, you can do it in a variety of ways. But what has traditionally been done, this is shows uh, different frequencies, which means how often you're giving the stimulus in traditional stimulation. It was it's actually pretty slow, 40 to 60 hertz. And then when you go to high frequency stimulation, which is one of the ways that we can change this, goes to 10,000 hertz. So we've changed that a lot. Another interesting way we've tackled this problem is this idea of bursting stimulation. So in the thalamus, when uh, neurons speak to each other, they do so in a variety of ways, but they sometimes speak with packets of stimulation. And so this bursting mantra, and that again is another way to um, work around and use mechanisms other than uh, the gate theory of pain. So I alluded to some of the problems with the uh, NRS and the VAS. And, you know, so uh, one of the ways, this is a hard problem. And, you know, we would need to put everybody's mind together and a lot of technologies together and a lot of different treatment options in terms of treating this. And, you know, I started by looking at this through my lens, but this is an integrative health talk. And I want to talk about other things that we can do in order to uh, best help these patients. Because the bottom line is it's not going to be, you know, in a rare patient, it's going to be one treatment. But in general, it is many treatments and figuring out how to administer them and how to do that in a syncopated fashion is important. Well, in order to know what's being effective or, you know, if you're being effective, you have to have a series of outcome measures and those outcome measures have to be reliable. And unfortunately, right now in pain, there is not a um, biomarker. So, you know, if you want to know, you know, um, a variety. So if you want to know how well your heart functions, you can get an echocardiogram, right? And you can see what your cardiac function is. And, you know, if you have complaint of chest pain, you know, sometimes you'll end up getting, uh, you know, a four vessel angio to see what's going on and whether you're having any heart attack. With pain, there isn't a test to say this person is in pain or this person isn't in pain. And to try to ascertain whether it's a sensation whether it's uh, you know depression, anxiety, whether it's some psychosocial factors is really tricky. So the best we have right now is what we've done in terms of looking at a battery of tests, not just what's the intensity and severity of your pain, but how does this affect your life? How disabled are you from it? What's your functional ability? You know, are you able to walk up a flight of stairs? Are you able to perform your activities of daily living? Are you able to run? Um, back depression inventory, measure of how depressed people get with this. And, you know, almost everybody with chronic pain is, is depressed. Um, and, you know, sometimes it's a little bit tricky to parse out what came first. Sometimes it doesn't matter, but you have to understand that you need to treat all components of this. Pain catastrophizing scale. This is a really interesting one. And so this is a scale, um, I've dubbed it like the pleasant person score in my clinic. Um, so it's a win if you can make people better on the PCS. This is how much they ruminate about what's going on and that can be pain or something else. How helpless they feel about the situation and how much they magnify things. And if you can improve that, that's a good measure that you're giving people some degree of coping around this. So this is like a fan favorite with people now in the, in the industry. McGill pain questionnaire is another mechanism of defining the pain. So you'll ask, you know, when you learn about doing your histories, you know, what brings the pain on? What stops the pain? What does the pain feel like? And these are some important questions. So like a burning pain is, uh, tends to, to stereotypically be a neuropathic pain. And you know, a, star, a sharp shooting pain stereotypically tends to be a nociceptive pain. And why is that important? Well, different medications and different therapies depend on you making that differentiation. And sometimes that's hard to do. And I would argue that in chronic pain, there's always a neuropathic component because your nervous system is going haywire. So we wanna do better and we wanna have better outcomes. How can we do this? 
And, you know, I think there's a lot of research going on in this field. Uh, Dr. Telk, who's in the audience today, is a new assistant professor um, here at FAU. And so one of the things that she looks at is EEG um, and, and not just um, like kind of the old school EEG that you think about, but like high resolution EEG that looks much more like that person in, in the picture to show hey, is there something electrophysiologically going on that we can monitor with people in pain and that we can say, okay, if they got better, this is something that we can alter. Another way we can do this is through functional MRI. Um, for those of you that haven't heard, we're getting a functional MRI in OB1 uh, next door. So that should be here in, um, in March. And so that's another way to look at this. And so what does a functional MRI do? We saw the standard MRIs um, that give you structural imaging. Seems kind of obvious. And then this is going to give you functional imaging. But what we have people do is, so say, um, I want to know, uh, you know, where somebody's hand or motor strip is located for the hand. You know, we have the homunculus and things that are pretty well amazingly preserved throughout um, time. But there's little differences. And that becomes important when you're measuring some of these things. So if you were trying to know where somebody's hand was on the MRI, you would have them do certain tasks. And so with pain, we can give people pain and um, or discomfort uh, and see where things change. So what, when do we use what? You know, there's probably a role for both of these things, but why we opted to go with EEG is one, um, in the long run, it'll be easier, cheaper, something you can administer and more practical. There's EEG home headsets now that, you know, as remote technology becomes more used in clinical practice, you could use. But two, fMRI, there's a little bit of a lag and we need to know what's happening at that moment and getting brain recordings, whether from the cortex, which is what you do with EEG or deeper structures is what you do, um, what you can do with recordings. Um, so flashbacks to M1 year probably, and you know, there, when you're thinking about the neuroanatomy of pain, we do have to think, we talked a little bit about the spinal cord and the gait theory of pain, but this is another reason why things are really complicated. If I have pain in my pointer finger, I could have a lesion anywhere from the tip of my finger all the way up my arm, you know, into my brachial plexus, into my cervical spine, into, you know, my brain stem up all the way to the thalamus or a cortex or a variety of other structures. So, you know, how do you figure out why and when does it matter? The lateral pathway, we're typically thinking about sensory phenomenon. The medial pathway, we're typically thinking about emotional phenomenon. And then we have a regulatory system um, with the descending pathway. So trying to figure out what's involved um, is important. And so what Dr. Telks did was, you know, she had started looking at, she actually started her work in Parkinson's and looking at deeper structures in the brain and then has moved to the cortex, uh, at least for the time being. And, you know, we look at people, so you see in green, the healthy control, so people without pain, and you see in red, patients, and you can see that there's a shift in what their EEG signals look like. Um, and that's important to know because if people are different and you can classify them based on this response, then you can also theoretically look at how they will do if given a certain treatment. And indeed, that's what was done in that fMRI study, which is seen below with the pictures of the, the brain lit up in different areas. That gave us the idea to look at spinal cord stimulation and see if we change the signals, whether that could change things. So, um, this is a lot of data. When you talk about big data, um, imagine 64 channels of this, an hour of recording, several of those hour recordings after different interventions, and you're going through terabytes and terabytes of data and you need high computing power. So when people talk about big data, um, you know, electrophysiology is one of the things where big data can really um, make it, or it is big data. So some of those uh, new and, innovations can help a great deal. So what Dr. Telix did was she took our patients and she did that battery of outcome measures before surgery and got an EEG, had them undergo surgery, um, and then 
also got an EEG during surgery and then checked to see how they did in the long run. And so this just shows that the patients preoperatively and three months later got better, notably in their NRS and their Oswestry, but here's the, the remaining uh, remainder of that data. And then exciting in the area where people feel pain, this matasensory cortex, um, you can see changes with people that have uh, the pre-op is um, in purple and the post-op is in green. And these are responders and non-responders. So there's a different electrophysiologic signature. So this has the potential to be really meaningful as an objective outcome measure. So what we did after this and getting us again into thinking about um, not just spinal cord stim, but other treatments is um, I've been pretty open about the fact that about, um, I guess it's like seven years now, um, I became very involved in mindfulness and yoga. And one of the things I wanted to do, because, you know, I think there's always the thought about mindfulness changing the way you think is a could this have an effect? You know, like we were talking about something really uh, electrophysiologically complex in terms of spinal cord stem, but how about if we just have a, a behavior and think about whether mindfulness can change some of these um, EEG patterns. So our group started working on this. And um, there is some data in the literature that it is helpful. Uh, so this was actually taken from um, a, a study where people with, um, these were participants that did not have chronic pain, rated unpleasant and, you know, painful stimulus to see what was better with and without mindfulness. Mindfulness is a really complicated thing to study. So my master's student just graduated last year looking at this. When you're talking about mindfulness, so um, there's like amateur, you know, uh, mindfulness people. There's like medium and then there's like hardcore you know like i'm going to meditate and be mindful like 20 hours out of 24 hours and the brain signatures are actually very different depending on who those folks are and when we're talking about patients um it is really hard in the majority of cases to get them to be the hardcore patient so you want to think about okay what could i offer to my patients in terms of mindfulness and what would make a difference most of the data that has been collected in the literature looks at people doing um, what are kind of the typical mindfulness relaxation courses, which are about eight weeks and pretty intense with a lot of homework. And so we wanted to know, OK, you know, if I'm seeing the patient in the clinic and I tell them to turn on headspace and calm, could that make a, a meaningful difference? Because that's something that people are much more apt to use. Um, and so we looked at these brief mindfulness innovation, uh, interventions to see if they would have a meaningful effect. So we took our patients with chronic low back pain and they must not have been uh, a meditator before undergoing this. Another kind of unique thing about this study is traditionally when mindfulness is delivered, it's not an online delivery of things where you have that interaction with people. I will say that my, um, my master's student was also a yoga instructor. So she had you know, some components of this where she could give some instruction to people. And we took healthy controls. We took patients with chronic pain. And then some of them underwent mindfulness training and some of them did not. And what we were asking them to do was five days of 10 minutes of meditation. We did an EEG before they had the intervention, did all those battery of tests. Um, it had a, a baseline EEG both when they were getting the stimulus and without the stimulus, meditated or did not meditate, came back, did the same battery test, did the same EEG, and we looked at the differences. So um, this was a, another one of my PhD students who will be coming on board, and many of you have probably interacted with, Dr. DeMarzia. Um, and so this was part of her PhD, which was looking at pain in an MRI. One of the things to consider in an MRI is that things heat up and that um, you, know, you can't have anything that's magnetic. So she created this syringe model of a, a way to give discomfort to patients um, that was MRI compatible. And when you're thinking about pain, you have to look not just at when the 
stimulus is delivered. And so we, before a person got in the MRI, we measured like how, what the pressure was in that syringe that we had to apply to cause them pain. And then that's what we did here. But you also have to look at the anticipation before that, because think about going to the dentist. So like you're freaked out when the drill is in your mouth, but you're freaked out probably even more before the drill is coming at you. So when you study pain, you have to think about that anticipatory and the after effects. Um, Dr. Burwall is also here today. So he works with Dr. Telx and I in terms of doing all the signal processing, because I think you have an idea how complex this is. All those timelines, all those EEG patterns, all those regions of the brain. Um, so this is like a, a big deal to try to go through and look at these data points. And then what we're able to construct is kind of mappings of, of the brain where we're able to make these a kind of colorful pictures to see where there's differences. And so this looks at the somatosensory area, which we knew was of interest. And we have control patients with that underwent mindfulness versus control without mindfulness. So going from the top row is a pre-mindfulness or pre-intervention. Bottom row is um, after the intervention. You, you don't see so much difference there in the, in the chronic pain patients. And these are the healthy control patients. And it's interesting because this and this actually look different if you look at the area where the somatosensory cortex is. So add on another dimension to this, healthy controls and chronic pain patients look different with their EEG. We then went on to um, look at uh, this in a different way. And, you know, depending on which region of the brain we're looking at and which segment, whether it's actually during pain or with anticipation, we could get different signals. So the bottom line from this is there is a signal there, meaning that something happens and we can see even with that brief intervention, people can, we can change the way people feel pain how we can make that more effective so that, you know, like I always say, when I'm looking at an image, I have to be able to, you know, like if I have to squint to see the difference, that's not a compelling story. So we have to get that a little bit better, but there is promise that we can do this. And this is very important because you're not going to get your patients to do an eight week intervention. So, but you might get them to do 10 minutes for every five days. So we're still working on it. Yoga is something that um, I cannot recommend enough to my patients. And this is something that everyone can do. So um, that may look very different. Um, you know, if you're 90 and in bed, um, then it does, you know, if you're a chronic pain person when you're 25 and ambulatory. But in general, this has been shown to be very effective. Um, sometimes the heat of not like super hot um, Bikram yoga, but like 90 degree type yoga can loosen up all your muscles. And, um, you know, so people will often ask me what's the best kind of yoga if they're in pain. And it's generally thought to be Hatha, but I tell them to do anything. It's use it or lose it. Get your patients up and moving. If they don't want to do yoga, you know what else is great? Like any kind of aqua therapy and getting them moving because there's some fluidity of movement that happens there. So make sure you're advising that. And there's good data here. This is looking at fibromyalgia patients, another really difficult group of patients. Um, because uh, when you see a fibromyalgia patient, you know, I'm sure everybody in the audience has a tip and trick as to how you can differentiate one. But it's often the patient where you touch them in a variety, like almost anywhere on their body, and they will jump when you just have to normal touch. Um, and so even in these fibromyalgia patients, if they do a standard eight-week course of yoga, that can be really helpful. Works extremely well for chronic back pain from a variety of reasons. One, you know, just flexibility. One, um, you know, just core strengthening. And I think the mindfulness component of this and the stopping what you're doing and thinking about things can also be helpful. Acupuncture, there is mounting data on the success of acupuncture and chronic pain. I think that's for a variety of reasons. And this is something that um, I often will recommend uh, to our patients. Uh, we are providing acupuncture at our clinic now. 
And, um, you know, I think sometimes like the big different insurance companies will pay for this and some won't. And so that's a discussion to have with your patients, but often in the Medicare population, it can often be covered, but, you know, cause that's a barrier to receiving care. And, you know, it's just the reality of the situation we live in, but does it work? Absolutely. And um, the people in this community are extremely open to these interventions. That is not necessarily true. Like this was not true in Albany where I came from, where I'd have to do like a hard sell on anything about yoga and acupuncture. So this is really a unique opportunity that you all have to learn, you know, about these things. One, because we have it, but two, because the patients are really receptive to this. Um, and Parkinson's is another area that is near and dear to my heart. Pain in Parkinson's is a lot different than pain in any other um, aspect. And so that has acupuncture has also been shown effective there. People always want to know if they should go to the chiropractor. And, you know, I, I always joke that neurosurgeons and chiropractors are probably, you know, like our arch enemies because they see our disasters. We see their disasters. Having said that, you know, my mother went to a chiropractor for years. Uh, anything in the lumbar spine, you know, I, I'm fully supportive of. Um, and, you know, I think when you're in the cervical spine, you know, I think just it, what I always tell my patients is, you know, eh, it, it, you can do what you're, you're going to do, but if it's something where you like say, oh, this is stupid or this isn't going to go well, stop. Um, but, you know, I think that this is definitely, there is a role for, for this. And I'll let uh, Dr. Drowis have a rebuttal about osteopathic manipulation at the end of the talk. Um, there is a lot of evidence that, uh, that uh, chiropractic works for um, low back pain. Probably the hottest topic right now in chronic pain and in integrative health is nutrition. And um, again, something that our patients are really interested and excited about hearing about. Um, the anti-inflammatory diet in particular, is, you know, I think that in general, um, with healthy eating, no matter what that, uh, just common sense, healthy eating, um, things are going to go better <laughs> for your patients. Um, weight is often associated with chronic pain. So you might want to think about this, but the particular hot topic right now is anti-inflammatory diets. Um, and, you know, so some of the anti-inflammatory diets that are talked about are things that reduce inflammation, um, you know, uh, and, and then some things that have always been common sense, like uh, omega-3 fatty acids, uh, pre and probiotics. And again, data to support the use of these kind of diets um, in rheumatoid arthritis patients, which are another group that suffer from a lot of pain. Just a brief mention about other things that patients, you know, I think the, the nice thing about diet, the nice thing about yoga or exercise is that in pain or in any chronic disease, part of the issue is that people don't feel in control of their own destiny and body. And so empowering people to take control of their own health is really important. And so another way to do this is, you know, kind of the sense of community. And that's something that we also work hard on building um, where if you're performing an activity with somebody, you tend to do better. So um, in my Parkinson's patients, for instance, um, I've always been big into building the, the Parkinson's community right here. We have uh, Judy Simon from the APDA who now works with us at FAU. And so we try to have people in a variety of programming where people get together and can do things together. So we have walking, we have singing, we have boxing, we have a, a variety of activities. Art therapy is a, one of these things where I think it's the community. And then it's also probably some of the fine motor skills and thinking and thinking about something else other than the situation you're in as a means of mindfulness that makes this really effective. And that's something else we're looking into is developing a program. Dr. Drowis is going to lead the effort from the med school side with arts and letters and figure out, okay, we have all these great things. Let's figure out what best practices are. We have a college of arts and letters. Let's have like the experts show us and help us design a curriculum for um, arts and healing. So in summary, um, SCS and spinal cord stim is useful in patients with chronic pain. Uh, we're looking at new objective markers. EEG holds a lot of promise. 
We want to make sure that patients are empowered to take care of themselves and we want to give them the tools to do that. And integrative health can be a way to do this. And at the end of the day, a holistic approach to this is really what is going to be in the best interest of our patients and the healthcare team that's caring for them. So thank you very much for your attention. Questions, please. Yeah. 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 Tai Chi is like probably the best, actually, um, you know, because I think with a Tai Chi, because it's so um, orderly and mindful in terms of the, the movement that you're making, um, there, there's actually probably some of the strongest effects seen in that, not only for chronic pain, but also for um, movement disorders. So, um, I think there's a, a, a variety of ways to kind of skin this cat. So I've had patients that are like, oh, you want me to do yoga, but I already do Tai Chi. I'm like, oh, you're good. You know, I just want you up and moving and being mindful about how your body moves. Yes. Oh, yeah. So many. So, you know, um, for I do a lot of deep brain stimulation. And so that's put in different areas of the brain. So uh, subthalamic nucleus and the globus pallidus we use to treat Parkinson's disease. Uh, the subgenual cingulate we use to treat obsessive compulsive disorder. And we use essential tremor uh, or the thal thalamic nuclei to treat essential tremor. You can also stimulate areas of the brain to treat chronic pain. Um, and generally we use, uh, there's been mixed results. So that we're like always looking for a new target, but right now what we generally do is we put two leads in one in the periaqueductal gray and one in the VPL of the thalamus. Dr. Locke, I'm well, how about you? Yeah. No, so this is a really hard, I know, this is a really hard thing to, to do. And, you know, the majority of times, you know, so this is somebody's had a, a stroke and they have pain afterwards and you may or may not see something on their MRI. A little bit depends on where their pain is. Um, and, and so, you know, when you're thinking about neuromodulation, the rule of thumb is always go up a level higher than where the pain is. So if we're having back and leg pain, you know, I'm not going to put stimulators in general on the back or the legs. I'm going to go up to the thoracic spine and do this. And so generally when people have a central pain, it's usually in the thalamus or the basal ganglia. So, um, you know, there's been some work done with motor cortex stimulation. It's funny, they, I just heard this uh, statistic that in neurosurgery, like the paper that you publish that will be the most cited um, is when you're 43 years old. Um, and it's actually in mathematicians, it's like when they're 30, because I guess they just, you know, come out of the womb brilliantly. But so my most cited paper is actually on motor cortex stimulation. And most of our patients were central pain patients. Um, it holds promise. It's complicated because I, I think, you know, we're, we're just kind of doing, we, all the work done there was with trial and error. Um, and so I've had some home runs and I've had some not successes. He's got all of this expertise in functional medicine and integrative health, and he is also So you can kind of see how we're all fitting together um, at the Marshall Center and be able to offer so many things to the there. But he'll be helping you guys with your curriculum, with research opportunities, clinical awareness. Like, he's just going to <laughs> 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 
Yeah. Oh, sorry. And that's a, a, a great point, you know, sometimes when people ask, you know, what What's the difference between a DO and an MD curriculum? DOs get a lot of what Dr. Drowis does. So make sure, you know, for any of the, our opportunities, like where you have somebody that is trained in this to learn some stuff. Um, I've had like the, uh, I, I've gotten to go to conference. It's like very eye-opening and fun and changes the way you look at patients. Judy. <laughs> I was going to bring up just to piggyback on what Dr. Buck was talking about. Um, we're actually seeing in, in post stroke uh, pain patients that there's an investigational therapy happening where you can actually block the cell again in it. We're starting to see some immunomodulatory effects because there's elevations in things like the factor and other um, inflammatory markers that are happening in post stroke. And then about bottom line with reactivation also that happens. So there's there's investigational therapies that are being done with intranasal uh, focus of the therapy. One in particular is intranasal synapsin, which is also combined with uh, methylcobalamin, which actually helps with some of the neuroinflammatory potential. So we're seeing some some benefits of that in the field of imaging. Yeah, and that's really cool because you know I think when we're talking about like if you want something intranasal versus brain surgery, what are you going to pick, right? And, you know, so I think that some of the, you know, the work we're doing is trying to give us targets to eventually come up with therapies uh, like he, he's mentioning, uh, because, you know, that that's just changes, changes the ballgame. Because even, you know, when we think about the stellate ganglion, it's near the carotid artery, you know, it's not a trivial procedure, um, you know, again, less invasive than some of the stuff I do. but if you can do something that's a medicine um, that can directly get to the brain or, or you know the nervous system, that's exciting. Sarah Green, for those of you that don't know, do you guys know Sarah? She runs Marcus uh, in Integrative Health. So she does, if you can believe this, 12 events for the community every month. Um, you know, um, in addition to classroom learning, I, I personally really value the experiential learning. So all of these integrative approaches to clinical um, we are bringing to you Rose Rose with Dr. Michelle, who helped first, and we're going to learn to you um, tomorrow, every month, and tomorrow we have Calm Wellness. Um, so we're allowing and providing opportunities for you to experience these approaches firsthand so that, you know, when you speak to a patient about acupuncture, we want to give you an opportunity to experience that so you can speak about it from that um, perspective as well. So if you ever want to join classes or learn more about the clinical services, we've got Dr. Collins or myself or anyone on the team who want to provide that opportunity.
And I think, you know, that's, uh, you know, it's really important uh, as you think it, we, we were doing an exercise recently where the facilitator asked us to think about something that resonated with us from medical school. And, you know, 25 years later, um, I, I don't really remember sitting in my classroom or, you know, I remember like the volume of work and all this, but those ex experiential, experiential um, opportunities are really powerful and that can help you be a better doctor um, at the end of the day.